Hi, today we're continuing the Fieldtech FY6900 power supply project. So we've got the PCBs through from JLC PCB. In fact, they arrived only six days after placing the order, which is super fast. Um, certainly uh, DHL did their job there in terms of getting it here from China in only two and a bit days, which is incredible. And you can see here we've got a really nice looking PCB. We've also got all of the components and the components are the reason why there's been a little bit of a delay because I completely forgot about some of the parts. Um, so I ended up having to order them from RS and Farnell. Uh, I was about to record the video a couple of times and found more parts that I didn't have. So disorganization on my part. Uh, but you'll see that we've made a few changes in the PCB since the video where I was designing this. So if you haven't seen that video, take a look at it at the link above here. But um, it was really nice to see some comments suggesting improvements and that kind of thing. So what I would recommend is whenever you've laid out a PCB, just take an hour or two's break and come back to it and just go over it and make sure you've not made any silly mistakes because it's really easy to get stuck into what you're doing trying to make it look nice and forgetting that you may have uh, missed out some layout issues in terms of making it optimal for the design. So definitely take a break and review it sometime later before submitting your order. So you'll see I've made a few changes. We've got some inductors here between the DC to DC converters and the linear regulators. That is to see whether the um, switching noise can be reduced by the inductors, whether they're needed, whether these linear regulators will do the job of cleaning up the noise on their own. You'll also see I've added some thermal vias, so I completely forgot about this when I was doing the design, but we've got a couple of uh, little planes here, and then we've got some relatively large vias, and these are designed to conduct as much of the heat through the PCB as possible, but also they're large enough to provide a small amount of convection through the PCB if the heat is excessive. So that's to cool down those linear regulators. Obviously I was talking about adding a heat sink bar across the two if it needed, and that still can be added. So we've got the stencil and what I'm going to do is apply the solder paste to the PCB, place the parts and reflow the board. Right, so there's our assembled PCB ready for reflow. And we're gonna heat up the hot plate so that the PCB gets to around 100 degrees. And we'll be using the Quick 857 DW Plus to reflow the components once the board is up to temperature. So this little Quick 857 DW Plus is actually a really nice little hot air station. It's super quiet. I'm not sure if it's coming across on camera, but this is on a completely different league in terms of volume compared to many of the hot air stations that I've used before. So I will be doing a review of it shortly. But yeah, it's, uh, it is a very nice unit. That's the PCB assembled and I'm quite happy with how it's looking. I did end up just replacing this inductor because I wasn't quite paying attention when I was using the hot air gun and ended up burning it slightly. So I've got a, a new one on there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna power up the board and just check that we've got the supply rails kind of working properly. And then we'll individually load up each of the rails, just make sure that everything behaves properly and have a look at what the waveforms look like on the oscilloscope at various points in the circuit. So we'll obviously look at the output. We'll look after this inductor before the regulator and we'll also look before the inductor, so directly on the output of the switching regulator. Now, typically when you power up your switch mode regulator board for the first time, you probably will want to use a current limit on your power supply. And if you have an inverting or a boost regulator, the inrush current is generally quite high and it will be trying to start up to boost or invert the output voltage. And what will happen is, if you've got any kind of current limit on your power supply, it will drag the supply rail right down and you'll think you've got a problem on your PCB. So what I'm just doing here is I'm just disabling this regulator so that we can have quite a reasonable current limit 
on the power supply and just check these two rails are okay first and then we can turn up the current limit and enable this one. So that's all in place. I've got the current limit set to 30 milliamps so let's turn it on. And so we've got our power LEDs coming on absolutely fine here. We're drawing about 19 milliamps from the power supply so these switch mode regulators each draw about 6 milliamps quiescent so they're not particularly efficient at low load situations. That's 12 milliamps. Then we've got three LEDs which are drawing about 2 milliamps, so that's about 18 milliamps. And we'll be dissipating a little bit of power just in the linear regulator under no load. They do draw a little bit of current, so that's pretty much accounted for. What we can do now is turn up the current limit. So let's turn that up and we'll enable the negative rail and see if that starts up okay. And yet yeah, we've got an LED lit there. The current from the power supply has now shot up quite a lot. It's gone up to 40 milliamps. So this regulator is drawing about 20 milliamps, including the additional LED. I'll have to just check the spec to make sure that's normal. It is typical for an inverting regulator to draw uh, a little bit more power because it's um, trying to do that inversion. But I'll just check the data sheet. So I've just had a look at the data sheet in the application note. It doesn't really give any hints as to whether the additional current is expected in inverting. But what we'll do is we'll just check the output looks okay. Nothing's really uh, getting warm, although it won't do at 20 milliamps. I mean, that's a typical current draw for a smallish LED if you had it on full power anyway. So I'm not too concerned at the moment, but when we put it under load, we will monitor the input current quite closely. We'll just check the output voltages. So I've got the digital multimeter here, the Mustool MDS8207. And we'll look at the 5 volt rail. And that's 5.049. So just a tiny amount over. And then we've got the two outputs from the linear regulators. So 13.45, just very slightly under there. And the negative one is minus 13.6. So about 0 0.1 volts out what I'd calculated. Now it's slightly odd in that these are using exactly the same value resistors and we're just getting a little bit of difference between the two devices. They should give identical output voltages but it's not quite. Let's have a look at the outputs from the two DC to DCs that are feeding the linear regulators. And yeah, 16.18 and this one should be pretty much identical but negative. 16.15. So those are both working exactly as expected. We've just got a very slight difference here between these two linear regulators. Let's put a bit of load on the outputs now and I'll grab the oscilloscope and we'll have a little look at what the waveforms are looking like. The oscilloscope set to AC coupling so we're only looking at the noise aspects. Then we've got the input current on the right here for everything on the PCB. So this is including the regulators that are not currently under test. Then on the left we've got the Flute 289 looking at the output current into a load that I've got set up just at the side of the bench here. So you can see just with the output unloaded we're seeing basically sod or noise. Uh, we've got the time base set up so we should see the switch in frequency at uh, sort of one division intervals or so, so five microseconds. The switching frequency of these is somewhere in the region of 200 to 250 kilohertz. And the um, we're set up to 20 millivolts per division to give an idea of the scale on there. So we'll turn on the load at about 100 milliamps or so. This is on the five volt rail first. And we can see there we're getting a little bit of noise. So at 20 millivolts per division, we've probably seen about 10 millivolts of noise there. And you can see we're drawing almost 100 milliamps. And um, our input current is 70 milliamps at 24 volts. Let's increase the current a bit further. We should see the switching noise go up a little bit further. So we're at about 200 milliamps now. Input current's gone up slightly. And we can see now... We're pretty much at 20 millivolts peak to peak noise. Let's go up to 500 milliamps or so. And we're drawing about 167 milliamps. And you can see actually the switching noise has kind of settled. So at low currents, it does go into a slightly different cycle mode. We're now still looking at about 20 millivolts peak to peak. 
and we'll take it up to one amp which is the maximum that I've really designed this for for continuous use anyway so one amp the waveform looks pretty much identical and we're quite happily drawing quite a reasonable amount of current there we'll just see if anything's getting hot if anything it'll be the diode I do really need a thermal camera of some kind yeah about 35 is about as high as it's going so that all looks okay let's switch over to the positive 13 and a half volt rail okay so we're on the 13 and a half volt rail let's turn on the load again at around 100 milliamps and what you'll notice this time is we're seeing basically uh, no additional noise here on the oscilloscope that's really good we'll just check that we're still behaving okay 13 and a half volts yep that's fine let's turn the load up a bit that's about 250 milliamps or so and we're just seeing the very high frequency noise so really just the actual switching and this may actually be being picked up by this big loop in our probe setup so not an ideal probing setup we're not really seeing any actual noise on the supply rail we're literally just seeing the switching transitions here and again we'll just check the voltage 13 point yeah that's pretty much fine let's have a little look at what the noise looks like at different points in this circuit so I'll just disconnect the scope probe and we'll have a look before the linear regulator now bear in mind I have got this massive fly lead this isn't ideal let's try and uh, get rid of it a little bit so we're looking at the input to the linear regulator now so that does appear to be making quite a bit difference uh, we're seeing basically a little bit of ringing from the inductor let's have a look before that inductor and that's even larger so I think we're sort of forming a little bit of a resonant circuit with the capacitor and the inductor here but we're actually uh, getting a really quite nice smooth output here so I'm quite happy with how that's looking but we are getting quite a bit of ripple going into this linear regulator we're now looking at the minus 13 and a half volt rail again we're seeing very little noise here let's turn on the load and set it to about 100 milliamps or so that looks pretty good it's very little noise again let's have a look at the output and just check that we're reading what we should do yeah minus 13 and a half let's turn up the load a bit more to 250 and I think there's just very slightly more noise there still okay on the output voltage let's start turning up a bit more and it looks like we're just starting to see some noise coming through here so uh, that's about 30 maybe 40 millivolts peak to peak let's just check we're still regulating okay yeah it's just a bit of noise on there let's turn it right up to one amp and see if we're still okay yeah so 40 millivolts peak to peak there but we'll have a little look at what the efficiency is looking like um, with the calculations in a moment I did actually have the power supply set a little bit lower I thought it set it to 24 but it's been set to 21 this whole time so the uh, uh, we do need to bear that in mind when we look at these values so I've done a few calculations and had a look at the various efficiencies and we're not doing too bad now because we're measuring the input current to the entire PCB we're including the quiescent current draw of all the regulators and the LEDs and everything that's on the board so at very low output powers our efficiency is pretty poor because the contribution of all the quiescent currents is quite significant so particularly with the 5 volt rail at the 100 milliamp test we're only down at about 32 percent efficient as we get closer to some higher powers, so 5 watt or uh, 1 amp being drawn we're up at about 80 percent efficiency so that's pretty good on the 13 and a half volt rails we're actually very similar on both the negative and positive rails so that's a good sign that there's not something going wrong on this negative rail when we have a look at the efficiency at 100 milliamps or 1.3 watts we're at about 50 percent efficient when we go all the way up to 13 watts being drawn at the output we're now looking very much closer to 80 percent efficient which is pretty good considering we've got that linear regulator in place and if we have a look here 
what we've got is the power loss of these two linear regulators. So you can see when we're drawing uh, 13 watts at the output, we're actually losing about 2.5 watts in the linear regulator. So we're definitely going to either need some heat sinking or some airflow across these two regulators, or they're going to get quite warm at maximum power draw. Uh, but if we just have a look at the efficiency for the DC to DC, so we ignore the linear regulator, we're actually doing pretty well. So we're almost at 93% efficient which is almost as good as the switch mode regulators are going to get. So I'm quite happy with those figures. They just look a bit poor at low currents because that's where the switch mode regulators aren't quite as efficient and we've got all of the other quiescent current draw going on on the PCB. So I thought I'd only focus on this PCB for this video. In the next video what we're going to do is assemble the AC power board. So that's got the AC to DC converter in it and a few other components to drop it down to 24 volts for this board. And then we're going to mount this all in the case, probably add some heat sinking or a fan. You'll see I've got a fan header on here because I was anticipating needing it. And then we can uh, have it all assembled into the box. Now we could actually just assemble this into the signal generator, which is why I designed it in this way because we could have a 24 volt port on the back and just feed it with an external power brick. So that is an option, but since I built the, um, or designed the PCBs for the AC to DC conversion, I thought I'd uh, obviously add it in for my signal generator. And then what I'll do is I'll release these files onto my website where you can build them if you uh, happen to buy the signal generator and want to build one of these PCBs. So I hope you found the video useful. If you've got any comments, please leave them in the comments section down below. It was really useful reading them when I was designing this PCB. I did have a chance to reflect on those comments and made a few changes to the layout. So really nice to see people paying attention and adding their own thoughts. Um, so again, if you've got any comments, leave them down below. It's really, really nice to read those. So hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, thanks for watching.